webinar. We're really excited to host the second webinar in the National Source Water Collaborative's Bipartisan Infrastructure Law webinar series. I'm Kyra Jacobs. I'm going to be your host today for this fantastic group of people that you get to hear from. We're really excited. And I am a proud member of the National Source Water Collaborative along with my agency, EPA, and I've participated since its inception in 2006. I helped to plan this webinar along with many other team members who are behind the scenes today, and we will I'll be facilitating it for you. I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be added to the Source Water Collaborative's YouTube channel and made available on the Source Water Collaborative's website in the coming days along with our speaker slides. And the chat box is available for comments and discussion. We encourage you to use it just to connect with others and to share resources and information as you're likely familiar with. However, we wanted to call to your attention that there is a Q&A box, a question and answer box on your screen. This is where you're gonna add your questions throughout the webinar so that we can compile those and curate them so that we can ask our speakers these questions. We'll have about 20 minutes at the end of the webinar when we will have time for a Q&A and I hope a robust discussion because these are complex uh, topics that we're discussing. Discussing. So there's a term called upvoting. So if you see a question that you like, you want to upvote it. And in order, the way to upvote it would be just like on your phone or um, on a website, you will press the thumbs up button on the question you want answered. So the ones that get more votes, of course, will be will more likely uh, ask the speakers to address because we may not be able to get to all the questions that we have uh, posed to us today. So I'm gonna kick us off in introducing the Bill Learning Exchange and today's webinar, a little more detail about the speakers. Next slide, please. So today you will be hearing from two speakers from EPA, as well as Martha Shields from the New England Environmental Finance Center. They will teach you about the Water TA program and the Environmental Finance Centers. You will first hear from my colleague, Bev Vasquez, and Addison Chow from the Water Infrastructure and Resiliency Finance Center at EPA headquarters. And then we're gonna have Martha Shields from the great state of Maine, who is the director of the New England Environmental Finance Center. And in between the two presentations, we will have a few minutes uh, to do uh, a couple questions for the speakers. So we don't have to wait until the end for all of the questions. And then at the end, we're gonna facilitate, I'm going to facilitate along with my colleague, Michelle Tucker, the, um, discussion period. And I just wanted to remind you now to use the Q&A to ask your questions for our speakers. So this is uh, a lot, it's a lot of information. It's um, the infographics showing the, uh, showing the, um, all the, all the uh, logos of the Source Water Collaborative members. And as you can see, there are a lot of them. So your webinar today is brought to you by the National Source Water Collaborative. The Source Water Collaborative was founded in 2006 with the goal of combining the strengths and tools of a diverse set of member organizations to protect drinking water sources. And you can see on your screen here, the logos from all the organizations that are part of the SWC. Uh, Christine, I might have skipped a slide in my notes, so I apologize um, if you are on the agenda and I skipped to um, the collaborative slide. Um, I'll just keep going with the collaborative slide and then I'll go back to the agenda if that's okay. So with regard to the National Source Water Collaborative, we have a great website that has a tremendous amount of information for all of you to check out after this. If you haven't had a chance to check out the Source Water Collaborative website, again, it's we've had it for almost 20 years and it's such a great source of information about all these topics and more. And this partnership is so valuable. We want, I heard a term this morning on a call, we want this to be your drinking water community. We want to be able to help you navigate some of these many challenges. And as part of the Source Water Collaborative Network, um, we have co-created this Bill Learning Exchange series. Okay, so forgive me, 
And if we can just go back, Christine, to the agenda slide, that would be terrific because I skipped the slide. Would that be okay? Thank you. Okay, so I'm Kyra Jacobs. I am your your host here today, and uh, I will I'll tell you a little bit more of my, about myself later during the Q and A piece because I want to get right to our speakers. So uh, we have, as I mentioned, Bev Vasquez and Addison Chow are going to be speaking. Uh, first, and then Martha Shields from the New England Environmental Finance Center. And then, as I mentioned at the end, Michelle and I. So the next slide, please. So this bill learning exchange, what is it? So we talk about it all the time because it's our learning exchange. It includes webinars and related resources for states, water utilities, drinking water, collaboratives, tribes, and nations, federal agencies, and other water stakeholders to best position your, you to use this new bill funding for source water protection. And this, we created this for you because we know that there are a lot of questions that we wanna try to provide resources and answers about the funding that's available. So you can see here on this slide, the topics that are being presented in this webinar series. And obviously today is the second one in the series, second of the four. And then throughout the spring, the Source Water Collaborative will continue to host uh, two more webinars two additional webinars in the series, and those include um, bill and funding through the U.S. Forest Service, as well as the intersection between bill and environmental justice. So keep an eye out for those. Um, registration is now open for the, the bill and the U.S. Forest Service, which will be on April 22nd on Earth Day. And then just wanted to mention to find recordings from the previous webinars and to register for the future webinars, please visit our website which is being provided. And you will also find additional bill resources as part of our learning exchange and recordings from the webinar series. So be sure to check out any recordings um, if you happen to miss one of the webinars in the series. There's also a QR code, which will take you to the website as well as a link that you can see in the chat. Um, before I hand it over to Bev and Addison, I wanted to ask our first poll question. Um, you will be uh, provided with a poll question to help you and to help us. So I'm not going to read them to you. I'm going to let you think and to do it yourself. Okay, so I think um, we'll wait a few more seconds and then uh, the poll will close. And I'm trying to make sure that everybody has a chance to to access the poll and I will wait for my my amazing folks in the background to take it down and then I will read you the results. So I'm just going to wait one more minute. I still see the poll, Christine. Have you closed it or is it still open? Folks are answering still. Kyra. Okay, great. I will keep it open. Just another will, moment. We will share. No problem. <laughs> no problem. I just don't want to cut anybody off if they're trying to answer it. It's a lot. It's a lot to absorb. I recognize that. So I'm going to be quiet and let you think. Okay, Kyra, we've we've posted the results. Okay, I have been told that you may or may not be able to see this, so I will just let you know that 26% of you mentioned environmental, uh, that you're familiar with what we call Tic Tacs, Environmental Justice Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Centers. 50% uh, of you said that you're familiar with Environmental Finance Centers. 38% said you're familiar with Water Technical Assistance, Water TAs, Web Request Form, which you will be seeing demonstrated in a moment. And then bill pilots, that's a lot of words. Uh, that was 14%. So it looks like we need to do a little more education around that. And uh, training and technical assistance for small systems got 47%. And uh, as your facilitator, I just wanted to say that before I introduce Bev and Addison, I know we all spend a lot of time on webinars. And I know that you are probably getting emails in your inbox as, as I speak. 
And I just want to encourage you to try to be present and try to, uh, if you can, just listen to the webinar and try not to multitask because there's a lot of great information and I want you to be sure to understand it because I still, after 27 years at EPA, am still learning many of our programs and I feel really strongly that this information is critical, especially at this point. And uh, because today is April 10th and uh, many of us found out today that the PFAS rule was finalized. I just wanted to acknowledge that and not be tone deaf because our water systems and our uh, partners are talking about it. And I just want to remind folks, this is not a PFAS webinar. We are not available to answer your questions about PFAS and technical issues, but we remain um, committed to teaching you about Bill and about the funding and the resources so that um, we can help you get some assistance because we know it's really important. So first, uh, Bev is going to speak first, and then Bev's turning it over to Addison, and then back to Bev. So this will be um, really quick. Um, so I just uh, wanted to mention uh, Bev, some background on Bev. Um, Bev is with the Water Infrastructure and Resiliency Finance Center at EPA headquarters, and is an experienced uh, professional at EPA with over seven years of experience in the government water finance sector. Bev has experience in providing technical assistance to a varied audience and has led projects related to water technical assistance, affordability, water infrastructure, funding, stormwater, and ag agricultural issues. She went to the University of Pennsylvania and has a BA in biology and an MS in applied geosciences. And she has, I think this is the most important thing in her bio, a strong passion for community and social services. So I'm gonna pass it over to you, Bev. Thank you. Awesome, thank you for that intro. Uh, so hello everyone, thank you for joining us. Today we would like to talk to you as uh, I or, or as already mentioned, uh, EPA's Water Technical Assistance Initiative or as we like to call it uh, in its branded Water TA um, and how we're working to change the odds for communities. Um, but this, uh, this particular presentation will be the EFC edition which essentially just means we'll do a deeper dive into uh, that TA program. Next slide. So here's our agenda for today's webinar. Addison will begin by providing a broad overview about EPA's Water TA initiative, and then highlighting a few programs before turning it over to me, while I'll do that more in-depth uh, look, as I mentioned, at, at some of the work that has already been done in this space, especially in regard to the alignment of finance centers. Next slide. Uh, before diving into the content, I could just want to quickly uh, intro, uh, I guess, myself and and Addison. Um, so again, my name is Bev Asquez, pronounced Adidam. them. Um, I work in the Water Infrastructure Resiliency Finance Center in the Office of Wastewater Management at EPA headquarters. I'm also the National Program Manager for the EFC program of the Environmental Finance Center grant program. Um, joined by Addison, who's also a project officer for one of the, the national EFCs, who we'll, we'll talk about um, uh, what that means, and who also works in the same office. And with that, I'll turn it over to Addison. Thanks, Bev. Uh, yep, thank you. Uh, so to start us off, um, you know, what is Water TA? Uh, so Water TA, these are free services, free EPA services that support communities to identify water challenges, develop plans, uh, build capacity, and develop application materials to access water infrastructure funding. Um, to implement Water TA, we, EPA, collaborate with states, tribes, territories, community partners and other key stakeholders. And so where is this coming from? Um, the funding for this, uh, as many of you may be familiar, is coming from the bipartisan infrastructure law. And so again, the bipartisan infrastructure law is $50 billion invested into water, into water infrastructure. And this is the largest investment in water um, in the history of the nation. Um, and so with Water TA, uh, what we wanna do as we are kind of implementing these services is have targeted TA efforts. And what I mean by targeted is we want to um, focus on disadvantaged and underserved communities, as well as those that may be struggling um, to access funding. We also want to be proactive and really shift the burden away from disadvantaged and underserved communities. Um, and, and be proactive on our end to identify and approach those communities who are in need of water infrastructure, water infrastructure support. 
And yeah, yeah, I mentioned communities a few times. We really want to focus these efforts, these water TA efforts um, on communities, really making this uh, community centered. Um, and to, to, to do this, we are hoping to you know, meet communities where they are, uh, building that trust, um, adjusting to their needs, and really just being culturally competent in, in the way we approach um, these services. Next slide, please. And so you see here a list, a, a table of water TA services. Um, this is a sort of umbrella, or perhaps these are what you see are buckets of what these services look like. And so under planning as an assessment, you can see a list of ways planning and assessment can be achieved, such as through community engagement, planning, development, uh, and coordination, studies and assessments, um, and so on and so forth with these other services like project development, partnerships and engagement and whatnot. Um, Bev will go into more detail with the environmental finance centers and you'll also hear from Martha, but I'll just briefly give some context as to sit and, and say that um, with these water TAF services, with these water TA programs, um, programs such as the environmental finance centers, um, these are grant programs. And when applying for these grants, when kind of proposing their work and developing these ideas for their services, they're basing their work off of these water TA services off of this table that you see here. Next slide, please. Um, and so here you see a list of eligibility, who is eligible for water TA services. Um, and you can see local governments and communities, drinking water utilities and systems. Um, so there are a number of um, folks who are eligible for water TA services. Um, for those entities that may not be eligible, there are other resources and other assistance programs within EPA and also um, outside of EPA uh, and other federal agencies that may be able to provide technical assistance. Um, and so, again, for the purposes of today's presentation, we'll really just be focusing on um, water TA coming from EPA. Um, but again, just as a note for you all, there are other services that provide technical assistance. Next slide, please. And here you'll see a table of examples of these water TA programs that we have. Uh, this first table are pilot programs or newer programs that we uh, had started to implement uh, this technical assistance. And you can see it covers a variety of um, different areas uh, just by the name itself. For example, Closing America's Wastewater Gap, focusing on wastewater, lead service line replacement, accelerators focusing on lead service line replacement. Uh, next slide, please. Great. And this is a continuation of that table. Um, you'll see environmental finance centers listed here as well as a water TA program. And you might also notice that some of these programs, these should have been uh, listed on the earlier poll as well. So these are just some examples of the different water TA services that come through EPA. Um, I believe in the chat, you should have received a, a link to this website. So these uh, this table that you saw, uh, this is from our water TA website. Um, you can also follow this QR code to find this table as well. And in addition, when you get this slide, um, the link to the website is also on this slide. And next slide, please. So this image here, you see um, the, what, the back image um, is the water TA website. And superimposed onto that back image is the water TA, water technical assistance request form. And so one of the ways to request water TA, one of the more straightforward ways, in my opinion, is going through this request form. So when you're on the water TA website, you can click on that, um, on that link, that, um, that highlighted blue bar, and that'll bring you to the water TA request form. Uh, the form is pretty straightforward to fill out. Um, you can see some example questions listed here, um, such as putting your name, um, your email, your contact information, and kind of some of the services you might be looking for. And if we go on to the next page, you'll also see um, just more examples of what this request form looks like. Um, you don't have to fill out all of the information in the request form. There are a few required um, areas. However, of course, the more information you're able to provide, um, the more helpful it is. 
Um, with that said, once the request form is received, uh, we'll review it on our end, communicate with the different uh, EPA regions, states, um, to try to understand some more information about the community, more information about the request being made. Perhaps there has been um, technical assistance provided. Um, and really just through, through this review process, uh, um, better understand what sort of technical assistance is available and if this community or whoever is requesting um, these services is eligible. Um, and apologies for um, how small the, the image is for, for these services and also for the request form. But again, there should be a link in the chat that will bring you to this request form page. And you can also find the QR code uh, will bring you there as well. Um, and I believe that should be my last slide and I'll turn it over to Bev. Great, thanks Addison. Uh, so now I'm gonna dive into one of the water TA programs, as I mentioned, the Miami to Finance Center, so the EFCs. So um, as Addison also mentioned, this is a grant program to nonprofit organizations and or universities who get selected to provide technical assistance. Uh, you may be familiar with the EFCs as they've been around for about 30 years, um, supporting a variety of my environmental projects. Since the passage of bill, EPA has greatly increased its investment in the EFCs and expanded the services they can offer uh, by introducing two new types of EFCs, uh, regional and national EFCs focused on water infrastructure. So the EFCs you may be familiar with are the multi-environmental media EFCs or multimedia EFC for short. Um, I'll, like, I'll highlight who these uh, EFCs are in the next slide. So this slide shows each of the 12 multimedia EFCs across the nation with at least one EFC per EPA region. The multimedia EFCs can work with a lot of different media types, including water, brown fields, air, superfund, et cetera. If a community was looking to reach out to an EFC to work with, um, then they should reach out to the EFC that covers their region. Um, so in region one, uh, we have the University of Maine who's uh, with us today. So excited to pass, um, pass it off to Martha later. Um, region 2 has Syracuse University, Region 3 has two um, with University of Maryland and Low Impact Development Center, Region 4 has University of North Carolina and uh, the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, Region 5 has Michigan Tech University, Region 6 has University of New Mexico, Region 7 has Wichita State, Region 8 has National World Water Association, Region 9 has uh, EFC of Sacramento State, and last but not least we have RCAC in Region 10. Next slide. So this slide shows each of the 13 water infrastructure, um, or as we like to call them, build EFCs across the nation with at least one EFC per EP region. Uh, again, these are the, the new EFCs. Um, so these bill EFCs can only work with state revolving fund or SRF eligible entities with that end goal of helping them to access SRF funding. Um, so again, if a community were looking to reach out to a bill EFC, they should then reach out to the EFC that covers their region. Um, so again, we have uh, University of Maine in Region 1, Syracuse University in Region 2, University of Maryland in Region 3, and Region 4, we have the University of North Carolina in SIRCAP. Uh, region 5 has CTLCAP and Delta Institute. Region 6 has the University of New Mexico. Region 7 has Wichita State. Region 8 um, has National World Water Association. Region 9 has RCAC and the Hawaii Community Foundation, um, and again, RCAC in Region 10. Next slide. Oh, I might have gone. Oh, there is a slide missing. So apologies. Uh, I did want to also highlight the four national EFCs that we have. Um, so it was just a slide that would list them all there. Um, Epic, Moonshot Missions, US Water Alliance, and um, RCAP. So the national EFCs can, as they, the name implies, can work uh, anywhere across the nation. Um, specifically in the water infrastructure area as well, that SRF focus. They are meant to help facilitate any gaps or fill any gaps that might exist across the regions, um, as well as providing direct technical assistance themselves. Um, so now, now I'm ready to go to the next slide. Ready? So uh, now that I've done an overview of who the EFCs are, um, I wanted to quickly um, do a few case studies to showcase some of the work that has already taken place before passing off to one of our EFCs. 
Um, so I did want to highlight a project that was supported by the Environmental Finance Center Network, uh, which is an independent network consisting of EFCs that work together to create innovative solutions uh, to the difficult how to pay issues of environmental protection and environmental infrastructure. So together the EFCN network um, worked on building TMAP or technical managerial financial capacity for small water systems. Um, this project en encompasses many different areas of focus, not just source water protection, but I did want to highlight due to the sheer number of workshops, um, trainings, webinars, and systems that have benefited from the UFC program. So this is just a testament to the importance of this program and the potential this program has with the historic levels of funding available to them. Next slide. So before I close, I also want to highlight um, some of the work that the University of Maryland has done in this area, as they've done a lot. Um, one source water collaborative project they worked on was in Christina Basin, which is an interstate 565 square mile watershed located in Delaware, Pennsylvania and Maryland. Uh, it includes the Brandywine, Wet Clay, and White Clay Creeks, and the Casita River watersheds. It's also a drinking water source to over 500,000 people in Delaware and Pennsylvania. So this project involved a lot of partnership and community engagement working, um, and community engagement working with nonprofit, private, government, academic entities to address water quality concerns and drinking water source protection across the, the different states. So some of the water concerns included impaired water, qual uh, water quality, loss of fish, uh, wildlife habitat and fish advisories due to nutrients, uh, sediments, pathogens, toxic chemicals, and emerging contaminants. Through this uh, intergovernmental interstate communication and coordination, the collaborative um, developed a Christina Basin TMDL implementation plan in Pennsylvania, as well as a Christina Basin Pollution Control Strategy in Delaware to meet the different um, TMDL budgets. And it also supported the development of a water fund to finance restoration projects. I also enjoyed uh, learning about all the community outreach and engagement that was formed as a result of this collaboration. Um, for example, they lead an annual bus tour and quarterly meeting city to stakeholders the opportunity to learn about and actually see the restoration protection efforts taking place in the basin. Next slide. So that's all I have for you today. Um, we look forward with working many, uh, with many more communities uh, through water tea and our tea providers. Uh, we hope this helped better understand our water chain and EFC uh, work. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to, um, or you know, any qu questions related to water TA or this process or the EFC program, uh, please email the water TA at epa.gov and we'll make sure to follow up with you. Thank you so much, Addison and Bev. That was terrific. And I learned a lot again. And I wanted to at least pose a couple questions to you. As promised, we uh, everybody's doing a great job upvoting. Thank you. So the first one is from Vito DiBiase. Does water infrastructure include watershed land and aquifer land buying funding? Uh, that is a good question. Um, so I will generally say that anything that's, at least for um, the EFCs, um, anything that's eligible under the SRFs would be considered an eligible project. Um, so it's not just water infrastructure, it could include non-point source and other um, you know, non-water infrastructure uh, type or other types of infrastructure projects. Um, so I'd have to, I think, look specifically into watershed land and aquifer land buying funding, but um, if anyone else on our team is aware, I'll defer to them. Thanks. And I have a feeling we're going to get into this in our Q&A at the end. So, um, and I probably didn't characterize it well, but essentially it's land conservation, purchase of land for protecting aquifers and watersheds. But I tried to read it the way it was written. Okay. The next question is from our anonymous attendee, community see EPA as a regulatory body and are re resistant to reaching out. Do you have recommendations to help them break down that mindset? And that is a great question. It is a very good question. Um, if there is a community like member that is a champion um, in that community, we generally um, refer and defer to them as kind of a, that go between helping us with um, creating uh, connections and, and building trust um, across EPA and um, in the community. Um, what we can also do is work with um, like if especially if there's multiple like T providers in the same space, often there will be one that's acting as the coordinator. 
um, that might be the team provider that is has worked you know previously with that community and has that trust already so we can try to build trust through that um, one team provider so generally we're, we're relying on um, champions champions uh, a lot to to help with that okay just one last quick question thanks for the great answers so and we will try to get to other questions later in the program but for now i just wanted to uh, ask one more question which um got okay sorry it's hard to keep up with them can communities uh can or should communities seek TA, technical assistance from multiple types or levels of technical assistance providers at once for example, submitting the water TA form and working with an environmental finance center. Yep, um, we've definitely seen a lot of communities doing that. Um, as I mentioned uh, just now that there can be multiple TA providers working in the same space. Um, generally, um, we'll try to you know at least identify if, if a community is already working with a TA provider. Um, it would probably be a little bit more efficient to just start with the water tea um, form and then we can start coordinating from there as well. Um, but, you know, y'all are more than welcome to, to reach out to the ESCs because ultimately we're just making those connections. Um, but if you already have a connection with those tea providers, you know, take advantage of that. Great. Well, I'm going to wrap it up there for now. Not that we don't have a lot of questions to answer and we'll get to them as many as we can in the um, Q&A session. And of course, some are being answered um, online. I just can't keep up with everything. So right now we're gonna go to our next poll question, poll question number two. And I will again be quiet. So um, we, you can take a couple minutes to fill it out. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to read the responses. So it looks like we have uh, we have 241 people on the line right now, and 38% of you are affiliated with state government, 13% with local, 10% with drinking water utilities, which makes my heart sing, I have to say. Thank you for being here. Uh, federal government is 21%, tribes and nations, 2%, non-government organizations is 18%. 1% uh, with an academic institution and other in the chat box. Uh, we'll, I'll learn more about that later. So with that, I am going to turn it over to our next speaker, who is Martha Shields. And uh, I am very fortunate to work with Martha. Martha is based in my region. And I personally identified Martha as our speaker to talk about the EFCs because I've had such a great opportunity, as I said, to work with her over the years. And she is super smart. She's really good at working with her partners and with those who she provides technical assistance. And as you will see, she's not only very smart, but she's also really down to earth and she can explain all of this really well. So just with regard to her bio, um, Martha is director of the New England Environmental Finance Center at the University of Southern Maine. She's for over 22 years, um, she has in the center provided free training and technical assistance to build community capacity to sustainably fund and finance environmental priorities and advance climate resilience. Her program areas include drinking water and clean water infrastructure, green infrastructure, nature-based solutions, and sustainable stormwater financing. She has over 24 years of experience in the resource economics field, including international work in Russia and Kazakhstan. She has a BA from Rutgers University and a Master's of Environmental Management from Duke University's Nicholas School of the Environment. Go Blue Devils. Thanks, Martha. Thanks, Kyra. Can everybody hear me okay? You know, I, I'm not that smart, Kyra, because I just adjusted my camera right before <laughs> I had to start. So 
that's why I was adjusting it when I got on. But um, I'm so happy to be here today. Um, I want to talk today about this really unprecedented opportunity to address water-related challenges from the BIL, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, that is currently available. I don't have an agenda slide uh, like um, um, Addison and Bev did, but um, what I'll do is I'm going to describe how the 14 EFCs throughout the country can provide free assistance to help communities, especially those communities that are remote, low capacity, and underserved, in order to make sure that you get your share of the funds that are out there right now and that you can tap into the forgiveness loan forgiveness opportunities that are available with a lot of these um, funds. Um, I'll also leave you with some resources and contact information on how to access us um, for that free assistance. As I talk, you'll see some links posted in the chat. Don't worry about them now. They're just a resource for you if you want to dig deeper into the subject, and you'll receive those links when you receive the recording to this webinar. Next slide. So we are the New England EFC. Um, we are just one of the EFCs around the country. We are a multimedia EFC, um, like what Addison described, um, but we are also a water infrastructure EFC. Our mission is to advance climate resilience by building community capacity to fund and finance projects so that they can actually be built. Our priorities, you could see in the gold box focus areas, reflect the most challenging um, obstacles, I guess, in New England, and that's why we focus on them. We always try to prioritize EJ communities, including those small, rural, and remote ones who often face the greatest environmental challenges but lack the capacity and the resources to um, address them. Um, and by community, we mean states, tribes, local governments, and nonprofits. Next slide. So I just wanted to give a little context about this unique moment in time. Um, the water funding and financing picture has drastically changed. In the last couple of years, the enormous infusion of money into water infrastructure is truly unprecedented. Um, there's a huge opportunity right now for from several sources of funds to address the years of deferred maintenance on this country's water infrastructure. EPA and other federal agencies well know that they can't get all this money out the door without free technical assistance that's widely available and targeted to EJ communities, which is emphasized throughout all the sources of funding that you're seeing here. Uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, the New England DFC is also a, a technical assistance provider that provides free services to um, um, communities to access the bipartisan infrastructure law. These monies are for drinking water, wastewater, stormwater, and non-point source pollution needs, including source water protection. We focus primarily on helping communities get access to the clean water and drinking water state revolving funds, but we also um, assist in, in accessing and identifying other sources of funds and creating funding stacks of different funding sources that align to solve your unique funding needs. Uh, the link below here you'll see um, to our water infrastructure intake form. In addition to what Addison and Beth told you about the technical assistance request that EPA has, we have our own intake form. It's very similar. You can do either or both. If you are, are anywhere in New England and you do the EPA technical assistance um, request, it'll probably come to us anyway. And there's a really robust system in place to make sure that um, we don't uh, overlap and contact communities twice or three times or a dozen times. So um, you can do both intake forms. Next slide. These are the services that our EFC provides through our New England Water Infrastructure Network Program, which is our water infrastructure program. But other, I'm showing you this because other EFCs have very similar services in their own regions. We can do so many um, things that um, are that meet communities where they're at, including community outreach and broad education, 
project planning, asset management, um, identifying pre-development funds of preliminary engineering um, for, pre for preliminary engineering needs. We can do comprehensive financial assessments. And then the important thing is we can take you through the state revolving fund application process. Uh, but like I said, this is just us. All the other EFCs out there can provide very similar services. So let's go to the next slide. You heard this from um, Bev and Addison. These are the water infrastructure EFCs around the nation. Um, there are 10, um, 10 water infrastructure EFCs and four national water infrastructure EFCs. Um, the, the technical assistance form is very simple. It's what Addison took you through. It's just who you are, where you are, what you're seeking help with. EPA then sends the request to the regional EFCs. And if they don't have expertise to help you with uh, your specific needs, then it can go to a national EFC. But rest assured that one of these EFCs will be able to help you access funding through the state revolving funds. Next slide, please. I mentioned um, state revolving funds in the last slide. I just want to give you a little context to demystify how they work. Um, each state has a drinking water and a clean water state revolving fund, and a significant portion of the BIL monies are going into these two state revolving funds in each state. Um, the state revolving funds give loans that are low interest and offer very generous loan forgiveness options for systems or communities that meet either the state disadvantaged criteria for drinking water or the affordability criteria for clean water. 49% of funds provided through the drinking water and clean water SRFs are forgivable loans to disadvantaged communities. One project type that can be funded by both the clean water and the drinking water SRS is source water protection. And I'll give you an example of that later on. Next slide, please. I mentioned disadvantaged communities in the last slide. I just wanna give you a sense of what a disadvantaged community means. So to complicate things, each state's definition is different. <laughs> Every state definition is built around that particular state's own disadvantaged definition for both drinking water, like I said, and the affordability criteria that um, determines it for the clean water SRF. The definitions are really important because those are what determine eligibility for additional subsidies like principal forgiveness. Um, you can dig a lot deeper and find more information about whether your community meets the definition of environmental justice or underserved by going to the link that is now in the chat. Or you can contact us or your regional EFC. They'll know and will help you figure out what sort of loan and forgiveness you're eligible for from the Clean Water or Drinking Water SRF. Next slide. So I just wanted to mention that there is another source of fund. There are lots of sources of funds. It gets a little confusing, but there's another EPA program called Emerging Contaminants and Smaller Disadvantaged Communities Grant Program. That's a $5 billion um, availability through the SRFs. This was covered in the last um, webinar, um, uh, the BIL Learning Exchange webinar, so I won't rehash everything. It's just to remind you that this new infusion of money is specifically for emerging contaminants like PFAS. And um, if you have PFAS, it's completely free to utilities and communities that meet EJ criteria, or if you are a small, small community, one that is less than 10,000 individuals and um, you, or you do not have the capacity to incur debt sufficient to finance a project under that grant program. Next slide. Just the importance of collaboration before you go looking for funding. You should make sure to tap into your current connections in your community to see if you can come up with a project that would benefit multiple organizations. Um, an example is partnering with a land trust to protect land around a drinking water source. Um, it's part of a land trust mission to protect land for recreation and ecological reasons. And it's also part of a utilities mission or a municipality's mission to protect land for recreation and other ecological reasons. 
if you can show a multi-benefit coming out of one project that you collaborate on, your, ab your application is more likely to get extra points and be more eligible for funding from the state revolving fund. Next slide. Now I'm gonna just show you in a little deeper dive into what um, source water protection actions are eligible for funding through the state revolving funds. The Clean Water SRF and Drinking Water SRF programs are capable of financing source water protection, but in different ways. Here you can see the eligibilities in the Clean Water SRFs. There are 11, 11 types of projects that are eligible. I'm not gonna name them all, but you can see how forming partnerships with a land trust or a nearby farm can benefit both of you and, um, and also what uh, maybe that land trust may be pursuing. And these synergies can really strengthen your SRF application. Uh, the fact sheet that is linked on the bottom, funding land conservation projects with clean water SRF, demonstrates how um, the SRF provides assistance to eligible recipients for projects that promote land conservation and restoration. And uh, they highlight case studies from California, Georgia, and Ohio. So please check that out. Next slide. The drinking water SRF is different because not all drinking compliance problems can be solved through infrastructure improvements. Uh, the drinking water SRF differs from the clean water SRF in that source water protection is financed through what they call set-asides. Set-asides are just a portion of the state's federal capitalization grant. They set that aside for a number of activities related to administering the state drinking water program. And, um, but it also includes technical assistance and training for water systems, and it includes source water protection. Set-asides can fund um, development and implementation of source water protection programs, delineating and accessing source water protection areas, and financing local land use controls. Um, you can also use it for developing a new source of, um, of drinking water. It covers like pre-project costs, like planning and design, and it can even cover consolidation with another water system. An important thing that it does cover also is land acquisition. You can purchase land at or below fair market value to control the types of activities that can take place um, in your watershed in the form of a conservation easement, which is really significant. Um, for both the clean water and drinking water, there's a really uh, strong um, emphasis on the ab ability to leverage with each other's funding sources and to also reach out to other um, funding sources like the 319 non-point source funds uh, that states have. And also there's a big USDA program for um, that also aligns with th this kind of activity that you can leverage these funds with. And uh, the last slide, please. I just wanted to give you an example of a project in Washington state that uses both the drinking water and clean water SRFs to solve a source water protection problem. Um, the Judy Reservoir um, serves 65,000 people in Skagit County as their drinking water source. They knew they had a problem because 45% um, of this water comes from um, uh, an area that was previously owned by a logging company. And um, the logging company was creating a lot of problems for them in terms of uh, road construction, erosion, sedimentation, things like that. So they knew they had a problem. They didn't know what to do about it. They knew they had to figure it out what to do about it. So they got a $45,000 source water protection grant from the drinking water SRF local assistance set aside. They did appraisal and um, they surveyed the property and they um, decided that to implement action, they needed to then go to the clean water SRF where they were able to secure a one and a half million dollar loan. About a third of that was um, forgiven with principal forgiveness because they were an underserved community. The rest of it had a 1% interest rate and they were able to purchase 250 acres to protect their watershed in perpetuity um, for its drinking water customers. This is really significant because 
Finding a new source of water can be very expensive. Also, building a filtration plant for drinking water is also hundreds of millions of dollars, and then you need to maintain it every year. Very cost prohibitive, a lot cheaper to put um, land in conservation to protect your drinking water and to um, keep it protected in, in, into the future. So here the lesson learned is that, you know, Skagit is a medium-sized community and um, it serves as an opportunity, example, a model for other disadvantaged communities to tap into the SRFs and um, do some source water protection instead of waiting for your water to get really bad. Um, EFCs can help other utilities um, or, or communities apply for the drinking water SRF to do an assessment of their source water um, using a source water assessment grant. EFCs know the el eligibilities of drinking water and clean water SRFs in their region. We can give you free assistance to help mix and match or do a financial stack using other funds to fund projects just like this. EFCs can also help by asking the right questions about whether synergies or partnerships with other local partners is an option to improve your chances of getting a higher score and getting an SRF loan or grant. You don't have to know all these details or financing schemes because there's free help that you can tap into. Um, next slide, please. You can contact me if you're in New England at that um, link you see, or you can also do um, a request from the water technical, um, fill out the water technical assistance form from US EPA. If you're in New England, it'll probably come to me anyway. So uh, that is all I have. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Kyra, see if there are any questions that I can answer. There are a lot of questions, Martha, which is good. <laughs> that means you're engaging your audience. So, okay. And your facilitator had a couple technical issues. So I'm going to do my best, but I might need to phone a friend. So I am going to start with, uh, let's see, bear with me, please. It's it's hard getting through the, um, actually, Daniela, if you want to come off mute and help me because I am, struggling to my colleague sure. Danielle Rossi is helping me behind the scenes. If you can help me, that yes. would be great. Okay. So one of the questions we have here is do communities also need to partner with a nonprofit organization for these services? No, no, no. Um I know that there is a grant out there called the community change grant that is that's required for that grant, not for this. Um, you just uh, you can just contact us. We help small systems, big systems. You don't need to pro you, no. You don't need to partner with a nonprofit. Great. Okay. And then we have another question from Jessica Casey that says, "Are you working on outreach and education in addition to infrastructure changes to protect source water in the future?" Oh yes, that is a huge part of what we do. Is you know, uh, communities, a lot of, most communities I'd say are not ready to just say, I'm ready to go for funding. You need to go down a long road to get to that point. And a lot of times it starts with community outreach or doing some kind of assessment of your situation. Also trying to get maybe a design in place. Um, and then maybe you're going to be ready for sort of for funding from the SRFs or other sources. But, you know, it's a long road. So and the availability of the SRF funds is not forever. It's 2027. And so if you are in that position where you're going to need to get a lot of ducks in a row, I would start right now because. It takes a long time. And if you are a disadvantaged community, a lot of this can be completely free or almost free um, with the loan forgiveness that I described. So I would really encourage you to get going ASAP. And the assistance is out there now. The money's out there now. Go get your share. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so there is a clarifying question. Okay, so the question about the nonprofits was, can not work with nonprofits or not required to work with nonprofits? <laughs> um, 
but I think you already answered that question, Martha. Yeah, I mean, get help wherever you want and or can get help from, but um, you don't need to partner with a nonprofit to tap into the BIL funds uh, that are in the SRFs. Great, thank you. All right, so we have a question from uh, Bill Sesnick that says, applying for SRF funding is, is a significant lift for many EJ communities that do not have the capacity to apply for funds that are not that do not provide loan forgiveness. How does a town establish eligibility in advance of applying? You Well, okay, so you might have to start down that long road of getting all your ducks in a row. And, you know, it, it seems daunting, but if you're, we meet communities exactly where they're at. And if they are low capacity, or even if they're not low capacity, if you just haven't planned um, for, addressing your source water protection problems, you need to start now. And we can, not just us, but every EFC out there um, can help you figure out what are your priorities in order to get to that point where you can actually build something or protect something. So um, it is it is really daunting. But even if you are not an underserved community or and you don't, you don't, you don't, um, you're not eligible for principal forgiveness, it's still the cheapest money you can get to address your problems. And um, you can still get technical, free technical assistance to get you there. There's no better deal around right now than going to the SRFs. Great, okay. Um, and then we have, what can a utility do if your state hasn't come up with an official definition of disadvantaged communities? These are hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, not every state is there yet. And it's being revised. And EPA is encouraging states to revise their definitions to make it more inclusive. So it is, it's not set in stone. It's it's moving and evolving. Um so what was the question? So could you repeat that again? Yeah, um, sure. What can a utility do if your state hasn't come up with an official definition of disadvantaged communities? Sure, yeah, okay. I was getting to that. Um, contact your EFC. They'll know more than, you know, they'll know more and they can find out more about your particular state. A lot of states, um, we work very closely with the state revolving funds. And if a question come, comes up that we don't know, we contact our SRF um, friends. And so I call them friends because we've gotten to know each other really um, closely throughout these throughout the year that we've been working with them. They're really excited to help communities and they're very excited to have like this added capacity from the finance center. So if we don't have the answer, we'll go ask the SRFs and uh, get you the answer. Great. I think um, let's shoot for one more question. I think we still have time for, for one more question. Um, so, okay, on this um, vein of the disadvantaged community. So uh, the question from Kelly Hahn is, does each EFC have a list of the disadvantaged communities in each state? If so, could we reach out to obtain a list of communities? State Rural Water Association staff are on site and meeting with communities daily staff could have target these communities to let them know that funding is available and provide the EFC contact. Oh yeah, that sounds great. No, we don't have a list of all the disadvantaged communities in each state. We think we do, but I'm sure we don't. Um, we worked with the state SRFs to identify um, who they know to be low capacity or have some kind of barrier that keeps them from um, applying for an SRF. But um, we have gotten just out of the blue requests from communities we don't even know are environmental justice communities, which is wonderful. But I know there are lots of them out there that we can and should be tapping into and any kind of um, collaboration around that sounds great. Just contact me. Thanks, Martha. And just before I turn it over to Kyra, just a reminder for folks to please put your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat. Um, and also, if you have um, questions for specific speakers, which we're going to get to 
um, at our Q&A section of the webinar, please um, write which speaker you'd like to answer your question, just so it's easier for Kyra to delegate the, the question. So thanks everyone, and I'll pass it over back to you, Kyra. Thank you so much, Daniela, for saving me. I really appreciated that. Uh, it's amazing to see all these terrific questions coming in. We want to answer as many of them as possible. But the next thing we're going to do is we're going to post our third poll question. But I'd like you also keep those questions coming in the back of your mind. So I'm going to pause and be quiet for a couple minutes so you can fill out the poll. Then I'll read the results and then we can go into a bigger Q&A. Great, thanks for the last poll. So it looks like we're trying to get a sense of, are you inspired by what you're hearing? Overwhelmed, <laughs> confused, all of the above. Okay, so that wasn't the poll. The poll was, do you plan on select all that apply? Applying for technical assistance on behalf of your organization, 12%. Partnering with another organization to apply for technical assistance, 7%. And 67% of you said, encouraging another community or organization to apply for technical assistance. That is terrific. And none of the above is 22%. I hope that uh, that we inspired you. And now uh, we're going to move into the larger panel audience, um, the bigger Q&A session where I'd like you to believe that you're at a conference like I was last week with you know hundreds of people in the room or uh, dozens of people in the room, depending on which session you chose, and remember what it was like to go to a conference and to hear a discussion and see people up on a stage. You know, we're going to have everybody uh, come back on camera. Daniela is going to help me in the background. And I was remiss. I am. So we're going to have uh, we're going to have Addison and Bev and my colleague Michelle Tucker and Martha, along with myself, with their video on and uh, so I wanted to apologize to Addison and do a quick intro for Addison. And then I'm going to introduce uh, my colleague, Michelle Tucker. And Addison also, as you heard, works at EPA headquarters in the Water Infrastructure, Infrastructure and Resiliency Finance Center and is a program analyst in EPA's um, the Finance Center. And his role at EPA has included management, development, and communication of programs related to water financing and broader water technical assistance efforts. Prior to EPA, Addison worked with audiences of diverse social, socioeconomic, and cultural backgrounds outside of the water sector. So please keep your questions coming while I introduce my unbelievably talented colleague, Michelle Tucker. So I, she's the bra brains behind this operation. I am just facilitating this for you because I usually ask her all the questions and now you get to ask her all the questions. So I'll read her bio, but I want to tell you that Michelle has both a background in SRF and was my fellow source water protection coordinator. We're sort of the bookends of the country. I work in EPA region one and she's in EPA region 10. And I have learned more from her than anybody else with regard to how to access SRF dollars. And in this case, bill funds to protect our nation's drinking water supplies. So I'll introduce Michelle and then I'll just sort of set the stage. We're right on schedule, so I'm very happy about that. And Michelle officially, her bio is, she's the EPA Region 10 Source Water Protection Coordinator and the Groundwater Rule Manager for their office in Seattle, our EPA office in Seattle. She's worked for EPA since September 1998 on a variety of both Safe Drinking Water Act and Clean Water Act programs, having spent most of her time at EPA as the Clean Water State Revolving Fund Coordinator. She graduated from the University of Puget Sound with a BA and an MS from Florida State University, 
her greatest joy working for EPA is being able to find innovative solutions to difficult problems that provide benefits to multiple programs, media, and stakeholders. And I should probably do my bio in a few sentences. I just beat Michelle by a little bit. I've been at EPA since 1997 and I am the source water protection coordinator for EPA region one. So I get to work with our six states and all of our partners and the amazing water system superintendents and operators who, uh, some of whom are on the call today. And I hear your stories, I want to help you. And, you know, we are all in the same business. We are trying to protect water and public health ultimately. So, um, Daniela, for some reason I'm seeing you, I'm not sure, Christine, what we should have, um, if there's a way that Daniela could close, is that possible? Because what I'm seeing is Daniela in my, instead of a uh, graphic. So I don't know, Daniela, if you could um, close it somehow, or Christine, if you have any suggestions, but right now I see um, the panel and um, I see Daniela's screen, but if that's not a problem, Christine, we'll just proceed with the um, Q and A. With um, with Daniela is going to be looking at the questions and helping us, uh, helping me um, determine which ones we want to to tee up. So, the first thing I'd like to do is give Michelle a chance to respond more broadly to some of these questions because, again, as I said, she has a very unique perspective on all of these issues. And you've all brought up so many complex questions that, as I know, every single community, every single water system is unique. And so it's really hard for us to give you one answer as it relates to your system. Um, okay. For some reason, um, we're being told that they can only see the panelists, not see the hey, panelists. Huh? Um, so um, someone just, yeah, someone said, we do not see panelists, only Kyra. I'm seeing all the panelists. Um, thumbs up. Looks like the others are too. So let's just proceed with the Q&A and see okay. if we can fix the visuals on the back end while folks are answering questions. Okay, so, no problem. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just so. going to start with the first question from Victoria Miller that says, what may make a town not eligible for EPA's water TA? And this is a free for all. So any of you panelists who feel comfortable jumping in, please do. Uh, I know that some states don't fund private entities like mobile home parks and and some states do. That That's kind of the example I wanted to put out there. So, um, but I think EPA is encouraging, like I said, the state SRFs to um, revise who they include as eligible for funding. Michelle, looks like you want to answer too. Yeah, so I am, um, and thank you. I'm always going to give uh, everyone else a chance first because I'm a loud mouth. And, I, and, and as uh, Kyra indicated, I, I actually ran our EFC for the last seven years and set up the new one in addition to having been source water protection for uh, coordinator for seven years and then uh, SRF for 18. So I'm that weird little person in the middle. And I apologize for my voice. Uh, sports are very exciting to me. So I'm, I'm a screamer. Um, <laughs> but I did want to just add on to that uh, with what Martha is talking about. And it's really, really, really important that everyone understand within the SRFs, it doesn't matter if you're talking about the drinking water SRF or the clean water SRF, it always comes down to the state at a federal level pretty much almost anything and everything is eligible. And then you get to the state and the state is the one that might limit it down. And so as Martha indicated, there are some states that are forbidden. They just can't legally, I, in my region, it's like that. They cannot lend directly to a private entity. But what they can do, and this is what Martha was talking about with the nonprofits, it would be like a pass-through. So from a source water protection perspective, let's say we're talking about ag. Well, in my region, my states can't be giving a loan directly to an individual farmer. They can to a conservation district who in turn goes out to all the different farmers. So that's why it's not an easy question. And many of the ones that you guys asked are great questions, but they're not exactly yes, no, because it's very much going to depend on what, how the state you live in organizes things. So thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, 
So Nancy Schroes wants to know, do you have any examples of stormwater capture projects that address water quality concerns, TMDLs, funded through these programs? Sorry, I don't want to be answering every question, <laughs> but um, we've worked with a couple of um, uh, states who are who want wanted to install stormwater retrofits. A retro a stormwater retrofit is a system that is non proprietary. We have a, a partner who develops non proprietary uh, retrofits, and uh, we've used the clean water SRF non-point source eligibility to um, help fund installation. Well, not just installation, the design first, and then the installation of the stormwater retrofits. So yeah, they're totally eligible. Excellent. And just a reminder, folks, please add your questions to the Q&A box, not the chat. That way it'll get answered. All right. Um, this question is, has there been any work towards engaging TA providers with PFAS experience? Yes, Bev. Uh, I can say that we're um, planning on doing a few more like training, the trainer um, type of, I guess, trainings uh, with here at EPA. Um, emerging contaminants has been one that's been identified to us. Um, one of our, some of our grantees has also, you know, expressed an interest in getting some additional um, training on it. So we are planning to, to do that. Yes, and Michelle. Danielle, I'm just, yeah, I'm just going to pop on and add on. Um, so it's really, really great what they got because you guys really, this is an opportunity to get the technical assistance so that you can apply within Bill, both of the SRFs got what is called emerging contaminant funding, as, as Martha was talking about, and it is predominantly being used for PFAS and cyanotoxins or HABs. That is like the two really, really main ones. And that money is free. Even though it's a loan, it actually is going to be all forgiven or whatever. So, you know, unlike most things, this is really free and it's a huge opportunity, especially given what happened today. So anyway, just throwing that in there. Michelle, I also want to add that this was covered in the last webinar, the emerging contaminants. So I really encourage any of you that want to revisit the emerging contaminants discussion that you go back to the previous webinar because you'll find the answers to a lot of your questions there. Yep. Thanks for that reminder, Kyra. Okay. Um, there are so many great funding opportunities for water infrastructure work through Bill and IRA. I'm wondering if planning work considers other bill and IRA authorities. Oh, it just went away for me. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, found it. Including those made under other agencies, USFS, USBR, USDA, etc. Since many other agencies have programs that fund water work as well. For example, source water protection, addressing water quality, etc. So, okay, the question is, I'm wondering if planning work considers other bill and IRA authorities under other federal agencies. Um, <clears throat> under the BIL, the goal is to get communities to borrow from the state revolving funds. But as a multimedia EFC, and not all EFCs are multimedia, multimedia EFCs are those that have been around for like 20, 30 years and we are capable of working on not just funding through the SRF, but also other sources. So what the benefit is, is that, you know, you might need to get another funding source to get you to on the path to borrow from the state revolving funds. Um, so we're able to do like a funding stack that it mixes and matches all kinds of sources. And I think maybe Michelle would like to add something to that. Oh, no. Oh, I just think you're great, Martha. I think it's great. And I'm actually doing that specifically. It's a pilot project in the for the Region 10's multimedia EFC. And they are, um, we have the money. It's bill funding, actually. Uh, it's just not SRF bill funding, but we are doing that. 
And that is exactly doing what you guys are talking about. So we're subbing with the land trusts and some other assistance to provide that technical assistance to these disadvantaged communities to apply to the SRFs. Um, but at, but they would, you know, where the bill funding is 49% forgiven. And so these entities and land trusts, in addition to that, they're then looking, how do we cover the rest of it, right? And that's where they're looking to some other programs, whether it's, you know, within uh, and because they have that knowledge and they don't have the restrictions narrow. So I just wanted to add to what Martha is saying. Not only is it possible, it is currently occur it is occurring, but like everything else, it is very, very dependent on where you are located. And we like to take it one step further and talk about sustainable financing. If these grants are gonna run out, what about the future? And so we work with um, communities on setting up stormwater utilities, which is very rare in New England. Um, so that is a big task that we take really seriously is how to set up sustainable funding sources for when these funds run out and communities you know, will need to tap into their other resources or their own resources to uh, become climate resilient. I'll add as well that um, we generally, you know, encourage leveraging funds or, you know, partnering um, to use other funding or um, having like a multiple portfolio of, of funds if it's um, applicable and available for the community and the project. Um, that's also the case with the SRFs. I know uh, the SRFs do track um, leverage funds as a metric across the agency. So it's definitely heavily encouraged to, to match SRF with other um, funding opportunities. Okay, thanks. Um, so there's a question from Tyler Bobco. Let's say a community has created a source water protection plan and now are seeking funding for implementation. Would this community be able to work with their regional EFC to access funding for source water protection projects in their municipality? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what we're here for. Anybody want to add anything to that? And, you know, you're one step ahead. So, <laughs> um, so that's great. Danielle, is it okay if I jump in and merge a couple of questions that I've seen come in? This one, I'm going to give a hard one to Michelle. So I believe this is my colleague, Tom Brown from Vermont DEC, which is a very progressive state on source water and uh, state revolving fund. So he's asking, what if, what if it is a three acre, I believe he says, he says SW, so I'm assuming that's source water, not storm water, project for a private borrower that contains great infrastructure. And that also relates to another question that came up in the chat about whether or not SRF dollars can be used for land conservation. And I'm the one who sort of muddied the waters because Vermont is very unique. They changed their legislation so that they can directly fund land trusts. So land trusts in Vermont can receive SRF dollars. I think that is extremely unique so it doesn't mean that SRF or Bill couldn't fund land conservation. It's just that in Vermont, it can go directly to a land trust. So Tom is asking Michelle, what if it is a three acre source water project for a private borrower that contains great infrastructure? Yeah, so um, unfortunately, Tom, I'm gonna have to give you the standard answer, which is it kind of depends on where you live. Um, I do wanna add to what Kyra said first, and then Kyra will remind me if I don't get more into Tom's question. So it's not actually unique in Vermont. Um, it's it's a very, so it, it really is very, very much state specific, like I mentioned. So there are states like, I, I don't know, California, Vermont, there's a whole slew of them that can actually fund uh, the Nature Conservancy, I'm trying to think, think through projects, right? Nature Conservancy, Trust for Public Lands, right? Some different land trusts. So there are states that can do that. And then there are states that cannot. And it's just going to depend um, because it's always allowed from an EPA perspective. But like we said, the states kind of work how they work, right? Some states, and this Tom is gonna, I think getting to what you talked about. So some states can altogether give loans directly to individual homeowners. So Massachusetts used, I don't think they currently have this anymore, but they used to have a program for a lot of years where they were providing um, uh, uh, funding directly to homeowners for their failing 
septic systems for their onsite systems. Um, and that would be the loan, right? So they would have, here's the 10,000, here's the 10,000, here's the, so they could actually do that. Whereas a uh, same exact example in the state of Washington, because they can't do it that way, they had to go through a conservation district or we actually set things up in a bank. Um, there's some, some places in the Midwest that did this kind of stuff. So it's, it's really all about your state. And this is where it kind of comes back into the EFCs because your environmental finance center in your region is going to know all of this information. And that entity can work with you to kind of figure out what you can and can't do where you live and there, and then you can move forward from there. So, um, and did I answer Tom's question or? I think it's just very specific. It relates to, I think, whether or not a stormwater project that is being requested by a private entity would be eligible for funding if it's for gray infrastructure. It's a little complicated, so we may have to get back to Tom offline. Yeah, Tom, it would definitely be a very was, specific sorry, kind of thing and how it worked out. Stormwater, I'm sorry? yeah. I just, oh, yeah. I just thought his, his response was, it was stormwater. Oh, so if the gray infrastructure is stormwater pieces, for instance. But it's a private borrower, you know, not a municipality. Yeah, but that, which is, again, totally fine. It depends on the state. So it very much depends on Come who on. the state is and whether the state. So like I said, there's a lot of states that will go directly with private folks, right? Private homeowners, private landowners, private farmers. And then there's a bunch of states that can't. And they have to go through those pass, what we call pass-through entities. So a bank, a conservation district, a health district, something kind of like that. So um, Tom, it's very much, I, I really would encourage you to contact your EFC, whatever region you're in or location. And that and that EFC will actually be able to give you more information to know where to go, like forward or just be, eh, stop. Uh, Martha's letting me know that she can help answer these questions. So we'll throw it to you, Martha. Okay, I was responding to uh, other questions in the chat that we're not going to get to. I'll help answer. But um, oh. <laughs> for Tom's question, it'll be me who the question comes to, and I'll respond to I'll respond to Tom directly about that. All right, Tom, Danielle, you were very me... lucky. I did not know Martha was your person. <laughs> <laughs> He's our troublemaker from Vermont. So. Daniela, I know we don't have much time left, but are there a couple more pressing questions and or we can ask Bev and Addison and Martha to close us out with any final comments? There is one question for Bev and Addison. Um, is there a list of all environmental federal funding available to communities? It would be very helpful if the list had timelines and points of contact. Uh, so we do have the Water Finance Clearinghouse. Um, it is a online database that has um, federal funding sources as well as state um, private um, uh, funding sources as well. You can search by, um, by region or by project, um, by scope, um, whether or not you want a loan or a grant, um, for example. The Clearinghouse also has a couple of other resources as well, um, like case studies, uh, learning modules and um, and uh, other types of uh, resources. So it would definitely encourage um, folks to check that out. We also gonna... have a guide we developed. It's called Navigating the, Fun the Federal Funding Landscape, a guide for communities. I, I can't access the chat to paste this in, but we can send it out with the recording, we can link uh, this document for everybody if they're interested in looking at it. We can link it um, when we send the recording out. And one additional resource, because what Bev talked about is fantastic, right? With it, at Sorry, WORFIC, I don't even remember. It's, I, I work for the government, I have too many acronyms in my head. Anyway, um, what Bev talked about is amazing and it's great. And I wanted to also encourage, if you are very much, very much focused on source water protection specifically, Right. Because that resource is amazing. And it's anything you I mean, it's all sorts of water stuff, source water protection. Specifically, we have something called FITS, which I don't remember what it stands for. So, Kyra, Daniela, help me out. Funding integrated funding, funding integration tool. tool for source water. 
And so that also will really, really help. And it's very much focused in because it's it's for source water protection specifically. So it will only, it would have a lot of those programs and within those pieces and case studies that are source water specific as opposed to sort of gray infrastructure or generic. So that's the only thing, thanks. Thanks, and we have one final question that I think um, we have time for that might um, help answer a couple of people's questions. Um, so this is a general one. Um, so it does seem like uh, folks aren't really sure if they're eligible. So can they just reach out to their EFCs to find out what's the process there? And is there a risk of reaching out too early? Can I answer that? No risk of reaching out too early. Do it now and we can um, figure out if you're eligible. We just need to know the specific details of what you're looking for. And, you know, it could be really quick because it's easy, or we can dig deeper and do some research and get you an answer. And I, in addition to what Martha said, just to add to it, um, once you contact, if your EFC is full, sorry, I don't know how else to say this. There's a list and some of them are maxed out and we have a waiting list, right? So you can't actually get in. Um, I would encourage, sorry, Bev, I'm going to encourage you if your EFC is really full to put in a note in water TA and submit the request that way. Um, so anyway, go ahead. I just wanted to point that out because some of them don't have capacity at the moment. No, we're just going to get the hook, Michelle. So I'm going to ask everyone to give a virtual round of applause to our amazing panel. And I will ask Kate to put up the closing slide. So my job is to remind you that we have two more webinars coming up in this series. And we have a really great one coming up that my colleagues have been working hard on, which is leveraging U.S. Forest Service bill funds for source water protection on forested lands. And even if you're not in the heavily forested western part of the country, it's still a great resource for us in the east and in the central part of the United States. So uh, please tune in for that. And then we have the other one coming up uh, on May. Sorry, I can't see it because of my um, my panel. Um, May, can somebody tell me? Because May 30th. It's Thank you, May 30th. Uh, so please register for that as well. And. The problem is we have more questions than we were able to answer. So we, um, at least one of our speakers has offered to try and answer those offline. So what I would like to do is just, I said this in advance, I'm gonna provide, Kate's gonna put my email address in the chat and I am willing to be a resource to all of you as your facilitator to try and get you the right answer. So. We can't do a written Q&A response because we have too many questions to answer adequately offline, but we will, as you know, have this recording available and we will um, encourage you to, to uh, continue to dialogue with all of us. Please email me, uh, please connect with us. And we know this is a lot of information. My head's been exploding for two months just planning this webinar, so I understand that it's complicated and there are so many nuances. So if you left this webinar a little more confused than when you started, that's probably a good thing because it means that you're starting to assimilate all of this information. But we just need to remind ourselves why we're here and why we came to this webinar today. Because at the end of the day, we are all trying to protect drinking water in the United States and to protect public health. And we have some resources available. And in my 27 years, I think this is the best opportunity we've had as they say, in a generation. So let's help each other do this and um, roll up our sleeves and get to work. Thanks. I think we're right at time. Christine, if I missed anything, please let me know. I probably uh, forgot to say one last thing. I can't, um, if you wanna jump in and let me know, or are we, are we done? We are going to conclude the webinar now. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you all.